even sitting here, but we'll heat it up a little bit. We'll heat it up a little bit. So we're going we're to we're have, we're going to do this. Raise our voices. We get, we'll, we'll get some hot air going in here through our masks, okay, and, and sing to the Lord. Please stand and join the praise team.
in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you to be here this morning, Lord. Lord, I know I'm coming before you humbly, Lord. It's this time of worship. There's nothing that I can do unless you work through me. There's nothing any of us can do unless you work through us, Lord. You were forsaken on the cross for our sins. This is a tremendous thought, a tremendous blessing, Lord. This morning, let you be honored and glorified in all that we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you. Take a wave and have a seat. How's that? Well, good morning. God's always answering prayers, folks. He always is. He always will. And said a prayer, Diane, Diane's home. She's going home today from the hospital with that, 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 that issue she had. With it. She's on antibiotics. She's headed home today. Be so good to us. And I want you to continue to uplift uh, Dominique. There's a car going around for her. She lost her mom. That's a hard thing. But you know what? The world doesn't have necessarily a lot to offer to us, but we can always offer kindness to one another. Kindness is never out of style. Remember that. Kindness is never out of style. So let's be kind one to another all the time, folks. Let's do that. Well, this morning, this morning the title of this message today is Being a Disciple. Being a Disciple. We're going to be in the Matthew chapter 4, I believe, or uh, 4 or 10. I, I always get it confused. I get into these things. I write it all down. Don't worry. We got the verses. But do we know what it is to be a disciple? I was thinking about this. Do we know what it is to be a disciple? I'm going to give us a definition of what a disciple is in a minute, but I was trying to think. I like to put things in context. I like pictures of things. I need to see things sometimes. It's the way my mind works. And I recall one time uh, my wife and I, when we had the opportunity, we were in Myanmar, and we were at an orphanage seeing the kids, all the little children at the orphanage. And we were there with them and talking to them through a, an interpreter. And I was showing them pictures on my phone of Marta standing in a snowstorm with the little teddy bear hat on, you know, uh, snow cap, covered with snow going all over, smiling and stuff. And the kids saw it, and they just giggled. They thought it was so cool and stuff. Now, they understood what snow was, right? They did, they did intellectually understood what it was. They learned about it, but they really couldn't relate to it. You see, these children have never had a snowflake land on their eyelids. They never caught a snowflake on their tongue. They never have. These things didn't, they weren't for them. And with that thought in mind, I was wondering, well, do they really know what snow is? I mean, think of the effects of snow. You, you know what it is. There's a coldness there, right? The temperature's always 100 degrees Fahrenheit there, it seems. It was. But they'd never experienced it. They've never been touched by snow. I was thinking about that, and I was thinking what it was to be a disciple. To be a disciple. I was thinking about being touched by snow. Now, what's a disciple? A disciple is a learner, a student, a student. A disciple is a follower. 
perhaps a follower with a little bit of intensity behind it. That's what a disciple is. They adhere to the teachings and the lifestyle of another, of the one discipling them. A disciple responds to the statement, follow me, by doing it, by following. And the term disciple, it's a generic term. We just, there's all sorts of disciples out there of all sorts and th certain things. You go on the internet, there's followers everywhere. You know, you have so many followers you have on Instagram or whatever other gram you want to come up with, right? There'll be a new one tomorrow. Wait around. There's always followers. How many followers do I have is what you might be thinking. You know, the Pharisees, they were disciples. They were disciples of Moses. It was interesting. At one point, Jesus had healed a blind man. This blind man was healed, and the Pharisees were not pleased with it. And they brought this man before him that had been healed. And, and, and this, this, this interaction took place. And this, this man who was previously blind, he says, and he answered them, I told you already. You did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become one of his disciples? So just think of that for a moment. This, this guy who was healed, he's saying to them, do you want to become one of Jesus' disciples? The reaction. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, and we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we do not where, know where he's from. It's an interesting interaction, isn't it? But they were disciples. They were disciples of Moses. They were there. They were adherent to the Mosaic law, and they added to the Mosaic law as well. They weren't real popular with Jesus, these Pharisees. But then we come to the calling of the actual disciples. The calling of the disciples we see in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. In Matthew 4, 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting their nets into the sea for their fishes of men. Can you see the picture there? It says, Jesus is just walking by the sea. Think about it. Just a man walking by the Sea of Galilee. That's what he was doing. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. And in verse 21, it says, and going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in boats with Zebedee's father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for this message, Lord, being a disciple, Lord. I do so hope that as we sit here in this room or watch on YouTube, that we'll get a better understanding of what it is to be a disciple. We thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. He's calling, Jesus is calling the first disciples in this text. He's calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He's calling them. Disciples. The disciples call. Well, what's a disciple? Well, we saw from that text. When they were called, they immediately came. That's what a disciple does. They immediately come. And Jesus, Jesus didn't tell them where they were going to go, did they? They had no idea. All they knew is that Jesus told them who that he, they would be with. They would be with Jesus. It's interesting when you think of this. It's a simple and pure picture of what a disciple looks like, I think. And to be an effective disciple maker, we need to know what are the true marks of a disciple. We really do. These disciples left everything. They left their nets, their boats, their families, and their possessions. They just left it all. This is when they were called. But I want to jump ahead for a moment. I want to jump ahead for a moment when these same disciples were sent out. Don't worry, we, we're not, we're we're not going to skip anything. I'm just going to skip ahead for a little bit. Jesus sent these disciples out to minister. And they were sort of like the master. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, this is now, understand, Jesus is sending them out. These are the instructions he's giving to his disciples, his friends. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for someone, some worthy person to stay at their house until you leave. Well, 
an interesting way to be sent out, right? The disciples, they left their comforts. They left their riches. They left their money, folks. They went out with no money. When's the last time you went for a trip without your credit card? I don't. They left without a place to sleep. Remember it said that Jesus was saying that foxes has holes to sleep, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. They were being sent out. Where were they going to sleep? They were being asked to do things that the Master did and was willing to do as disciples. They had no staff with them. No big deal. It was a big deal. There was feral dogs at this time. We keep dogs as pets. Dogs at that time were pests with teeth. They were dangerous. Dog, because, to be called a dog from biblical times is really, really negative. Okay? No staff. Just go. The disciple is worth his keep. There is worthiness as a worker in the eyes of God being a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's telling them, don't worry about it. Someone's going to take you in. Have some faith. In Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walking in the works that the disciples were created to do is where the disciples' worth is found. Just as the disciples immediately left their nets or they went out and did as they were told. So every disciple in every age should do the same. You see, there's not two sets of rules. There's not a set of rules for the first century disciples and another set of rules for the 21st century disciples. There's only one set of rules. Do we understand what a disciple is? Are we starting to gain some clarity? Maybe, maybe not. Are we moving immediately when we're called to do something? Or are we weighing out the options and the consequences first before we act? How long does it take me to decide what to do in service to God? Come on, do I check on my calendar? Oh, I'll have to see if I can fit in my time to serve God. Because those first century disciples, they didn't. They immediately did what they were supposed to do. They forsook their safety. Safety and discipleship. <laughs> what did Jesus tell them? Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Their safety was forfeited as we see safety today. But they went. We support missionaries in parts of the world that are extremely hostile to Christianity. Yet they go. They do bomb checks in the sanctuary before service. Are they safe? If they're in the will of God, then they couldn't be any safer. We should keep that in mind. Am I in the will of God? You want to be safe? Be in the will of God. What's this all mean? Well, it's a little partial picture of what a disciple looks like. But who were the disciples? Who were they? <laughs> Were they an elite team of spiritual warriors with great powers to come to defend the earth? That's what we always think. You know, that's, that's our superhero mentality. And I love superheroes. Don't misunderstand me. I love superheroes. But uh, let's take a little quick view of who these disciples were. We already saw that Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were fishermen, right? They were out there. They were just fishermen. Do you think that their profession endowed them with great evangelical skills or spiritual discernment being a Fishermen? I don't think so. Then there's Matthew, the tax collector. Think of this. Jesus chose Matthew, the tax collector. He chose a guy that took money from the Jews and gave it to Rome. Who did the Jews hate most? Rome. Jesus chose him. Jesus chose him. Not a good choice. Not only that, but when Jesus sent the disciples out, he sent them out to the Jews, not the Gentiles. He said in Matthew, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. How could it be good to pick Matthew? He was hated by the Jews. And then there's Simon the Zealot. So you have Simon Peter, right? Then this guy, Simon the Zealot, another guy. He's a zealot. We don't know what he did for a living, but he was a zealot. What's a zealot? Well, they have zeal. They fought against Rome. He hated Rome. He did whatever he could to 
mess up Rome's plan. That's what he did. Zealots fought against them. They fought tremendously against them. So let's think about this on, 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 on Team Jesus. You've chosen Matthew, who's hated by the Jews, right, supporting Rome, and then you've chose Simon the Zealot, who hates Rome, to be on the same team. Doesn't seem like the kind of people I would choose to put on a team. Then is Judas. His occupation is unknown. All we know is from John chapter 12 is that he was a thief. He was a thief. That's what it says. When Jesus was anointed with precious oil, what did he, he, he just clamored, what'd you do that for? We could have sold that to take care of the poor, right? He was also a liar because he was a thief. A couple of other guys, Thomas and Nathaniel, with other, two other disciples that were unknown, in John 21, they were fishermen as well. Jesus was preparing breakfast on the shoreline. When the, when, after Jesus you know, was resurrected, the disciples they didn't know what to do, so they went back to fishing. I mean, what are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? And of course, they see Jesus on the shore, and they go running ashore to see them, and Thomas and Nathaniel and a couple of other disciples were there. They were fishermen as well. And then there's Philip, there's Thaddeus, and there's James of Alphaeus. It doesn't say, we don't know what their occupations were. Come along, one more, Matthias. Matthias was chosen to replace Judas, okay? And the last one's Paul. Paul's an interesting choice, huh? The only religious man above the disciples, but he's a Pharisee. Why would you choose this guy? Not just a Pharisee, but a zealous one. He was committed to stamping out Christianity. That's where uh, what, when he was Saul, that's where he was. Jesus sort of chose the captain of the other team, didn't he, to be on his team. Have we ever considered who these guys were? They were not the Avengers. They were not the Avengers. But they were reflective of the society that they lived in. There was nothing inherently good about any of them to provoke, provoke a thought that any one of them was right to be a disciple. There isn't. You know, the saying goes, and we have a book in a lending library, God chose 12 ordinary men to do extraordinary things. That happened when the Holy Spirit came upon them after Jesus ascended. What changed in them is they had been with Jesus. They were touched by the Master. May the same be said of us. My point, no one's right to follow Jesus. There's no best candidate like a job interview. You don't look through a bunch of resumes to see who's going to be best. Paul, that religious guy, religious, really? He was going 180 degrees the wrong way. Jesus knocked him to his feet on the road to Damascus. No. The follower, a follower is a product of the teacher. And the follower should act like the teacher and be like the teacher. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but, it, but have the light of life. If I am a follower of Christ, I should be walking in the light. I should not be in darkness. You should not be in darkness if you are a disciple. Let's drill down for a moment what these terms mean. Disciple and Christian, these terms that we use. Hey, a disciple and a Christian, are they the same person? Interesting. They are, but let's talk about it. Were the first, dis first 12 disciples, the apostles, were they Christians? So an apostle is one who was sent out, right? A disciple is a follower. A disciple is a learner or a student. They're totally committed. Disciples, who were they? In Luke 14, it says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So the disciples went out and did as Jesus commanded them. Do you see a pattern developing here what a disciple is? It's pretty important. Jesus' disciples were taught by him by over, for over three years. They had a lot of baggage, folks. They were people. They had prejudice. They had bad habits. There was a lot to work out. And their worldview was dominated by the law. The law. 
a law that they knew they could never maintain. They never could. Paul said in the book of Galatians that the law was a tutor to bring mankind to God. That's what the law was there for. So effectively, the Jews were being discipled by the law. But the law had changed. It had morphed. It had become something else. It became a ruling, ro ruling rod over these people. But what was Jesus teaching his disciples? Jesus taught in Romans, Oh, no man nothing except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Fulfilled the law. And think about who is saying that in Romans. That's the writing of Paul. Paul, he was embedded in the law, wasn't he? He was there when he was Saul. He was embedded in there. He used the, he used the law as a rod to control people. You know, the law was never the issue because Jesus came to fulfill the law. Love is the fulfill, fulfillment of the law. It's what people did with the law that hurt. In Galatians 5, 14, it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This all requires that we've been with Jesus, that we've been touched by Jesus. Think about the fact that Jesus never referred to his followers as Christians, but as disciples or servants or friends. What did Jesus call his followers? In John, he tells us, For you are my friends, if you do whatever I commanded you. So no, there's things that Jesus tells his disciples to do, and we do them. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I say, but I have called you friends. For all things I heard from my father, I have made known to you. See, the term Christian was used after Jesus' resurrection. After his resurrection. That's what he, the Christians were called first called Christians to Antioch. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. It's a simple statement. Yet we live in a day today, I fear that it means almost nothing to be a Christian or carry that name. What do I mean? Oh, how about some statistics? How about some facts? Just going through this. Statistically, four out of five people in the United States claim to be Christian. Over half of these people never go to church. Over half of these people do not believe that the Bible is true. As this survey went on, as I was going through information, they started asking people they're Christians. Then they drill down further into it, and they say, well, are you a born-again Christian? Strange statement. But people don't know. You, have to be you must be born again. That is not something that's common in our, co our country. You would think that it would be, but there is impossible to be a Christian unless you are born again. Why that's so important is because Christians have become indistinguishable from the world. We've become camouflaged Christian. You know, over half of these that claim to be born-again Christians believe that works can get them to heaven. They believe that the Christian God and the Muslim God are the same, and they believe that Jesus is sin, which is why I'm questioning the term Christian. People culturally identify themselves as Christians, but are not biblically followers or disciples of Christ. So many people think they are going to heaven. They think they're Christians, and they are not. This is both possible and probable according to Jesus. Do you know this verse? I've read it before, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the Father of my will in heaven. So you're doing the father of the will if you're a disciple. The father of the Lord. You're doing the Lord's will if you're his disciple. And then it says this in verse 22. Many, many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done wondrous works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Does it shock us at all that Jesus said that many, many people are not followers of his? They think they're followers. They're not. Think of that for a moment. People say, of course I'm a Christian. What do you mean? I'm a Christian. 
You know what the worst time to find out that you're lying to yourself about your Christianity? is when you stand before Jesus Christ, the one who was forsaken on the cross for our sins, and he says to you, I never knew you. What's Jesus saying? You were never my follower. He said, follow me. He says to these people, I never knew you. Is a picture of a disciple maybe changing a little bit from black and white to color? Because as I study this, thinking it through, what a disciple was, what a Christian was, it got me. Because we sort of assume that there's flavors of Christianity in our country, right? Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. It's all great. Don't worry about it. You're a Christian. Don't worry about what you're doing. We sort of accept degrees of being comfortable as being a Christian. But when Jesus sent his disciples out, I don't think there was degrees of being comfortable. They went with no money, no food, no extra clothing, no place to stay at night. And this is going out into a world that was filled with what we call wolves. So I think that loophole for the diversity of the flavors of Christianity sort of vaporizes with this. See, follow me is a path that's hard. It is. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many, many who go by it. Again, many are going through the wide gate. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there's few who find it. I think the disciples, when they went out, it was difficult for them. It really was. But few follow. Only a few do. You know, a lot of times, I'll be out and speaking with people and chit-chatting away. And they'll ask me, oh, what, kind, what church do you go to? What do you attend? What do you go to? Once again, I'm talking about God a lot. I'm not obnoxious, folks, when I'm out there. Really, I'm not. <laughs> you might think I am. But let me explain. I find that people talk about things that light up their life. Case in point, if you speak to a mother here about their children, right away, they'll start talking about their children. You know why? Because they light up their life. Hey, you start having a dialogue with a couple of people that like computers and information technology, boom. You get a dialogue going on about cybersecurity and RAM and Bits and bites because it lights up their life. People with their phones, they love their phones. People have dialogues with each other looking down at their phones, right? That's what we do. We love our phones. Do we speak about Jesus with the same frequency, fervor, and fanaticism as people speaking about the new iPhone 12 that's out? People are crazy over this thing. You see, disciples did speak about Jesus with fanaticism. So when people ask me about what church I attend, I am careful in saying that it is a Christian church. Because I don't want people's preconceived notions about the church I go to to shut them off. People who hear the term Baptist, and they have a, this ignorant but preconceived notion. Oh, I, don't, I, don't, I can't go there. That's Baptist. They, they don't even know what that means. They don't. Let's be honest, people don't know what that means, but it's not something they're familiar with. That's just what happens. So I avoid it at first, because I know they have a certain worldview. But now after studying about what a disciple is, I become aware of using the term Christian. What am I associating myself with if I say I'm a Christian? If I'm standing in line with a bunch of people, we're all Christians. You believe Jesus sinned? You don't believe the Bible? We're all Christians? How does this work? I don't know. Does Christianity today reflect what the followers look like? Think about Christianity as we have in this country. Does this look like what those disciples were doing? In the first century church, they didn't refer to each other as Christians. They called each other disciples. They called each other saints, brothers and sisters, people of the way. That's how they spoke to each other in the church. They didn't call each other Christians. The term Christians, as we said, it was coined in Antioch. And it's interesting. I was wondering how it, got, how it came about, right? I think it's because these people were different. They were different. All these religions, things were happening. Now we have a group of people that stuck out. I think they stuck out because they loved one another. Because of that, they were called Christians. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Being a disciple leads to making disciples. 
the make part doesn't mean that we gather together in small groups of like-minded people in a bubble created for Christian holiness. That's not how you make disciples. Quite the opposite. The make means the disciple is reaching out to the unreached world. The disciple has been taught, equipped to reach out to others as fishers of men. We use terms like, are you saved? Or is Jesus your personal savior? Do we, do we ever ask people, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? We may hear, are you a Christian? But really do we hear, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? But that's what Jesus initiated and what we're commanded to make according to Matthew 28, 19. It's simple. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. His last command is our greatest concern. Go make disciples. How can I do that? I'm not Jesus. Make disciples? How can I say to someone, follow me? You know, we can if we are disciples, if we are followers, if we are learners, if we've committed our lives to Christ, and we're not camouflaged in this world, you and I, we can make disciples, if we are disciples. If we're not making disciples, why not? Are the wolves in our lives bigger than the wolves of those disciples in the first century? we got plenty of money. We've got everything. What's our obstacle to making disciples? Making disciples. You know, I reviewed my old career. As I was looking at this, I started, I started thinking about my old career in analytical chemistry. And I've trained a lot of people in the laboratory. I really have. This message had me questioning everything I've done. <laughs> I've trained so many people in the discipline of analytical chemistry. Discipline is the practice of training people to obey rules or codes of behavior. Imparting knowledge to them that I had so they knew what I knew. When you're discipling someone, you're teaching them to know what you know. That's what Jesus said in, in, in John 15 earlier. He said, for all things I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus didn't hold anything back. I realized over the years, without knowing it then, that I was asking them to explain back to the process and the procedures that I had been, that they had become proficient in. And I'd asked them to do these procedures to show that they were proficient in them. It was interesting. Then in the last 20 years, I realized I was training people. I continued to tell them they needed to know how to do this so that they can train someone else because a day is going to come when I won't be here. I realized that as I was reflecting on this. I won't be there. I was oblivious to the fact that I was discipling them the exact way that Jesus intended his disciples to go out into the world and make disciples. I was clueless that the church had taught me the best possible plan for the continuance of knowledge in my workplace. I thought I made it up. Boy, was I wrong. I learned this process inside these four walls, right here. This is where I learned how to do that in the workplace. I plan on doing a very good job of discipling going forward right here in these four walls. There seems to be confusion what it is to be a disciple in the church. From the beginning, Jesus said, follow me. Being a disciple is to follow Jesus. To be a disciple from the beginning of Christianity meant to make disciples. Jesus said, follow me. Enter into a relationship with me. It's not about a bunch of rules and regulations. We can go to other religions. Hindus believe in a path of remission of sins from life and death experience of reincarnation and dealing with the Ganges River and being washed in it. You gotta do these things. In Islam, Muhammad was pointing his followers to the Quran and the five pillars of the Muslims for Muslims to practice, these things they need to do. Buddhists follow the Buddha's eightfold 
uh, path among the four noble truths. They had to follow and do these things. Jesus simply said, follow me. He said, follow me. He called us to himself. He never said there's certain rules, regulations we had to do. There's no rituals we had to perform, no path to pursue. He said, follow me. In doing this, he invited his followers into a personal relationship with him. Doesn't make any difference how many times you wash your body in a river, how many times a day you pray and to what direction, how far down the path you need to go to help the needy, saying the right prayers, singing the right songs, saying the right things. None of those things will ever remove the evil that's in a person's heart. I said at the beginning of this message, those children in Myanmar, they had never had snowflakes land on their eyelids to feel that flicker. They never had it on their tongues. They'd never been touched by a snowflake. With that thought, did they really know what snow was? They never experienced it, the essence of it. They do not know. When Jesus said, follow me to his disciples, the disciple is touched by Jesus. The disciple immediately follows. Where the disciple goes doesn't matter because he's been called to follow. She's been called to follow. Who the disciple is following is all that matters. We're following Jesus. So the goal of discipleship is to make people that make disciples. A disciple learns from the person discipling them, but must move on and make disciples. That's what it says. Make disciples of all nations. People are led by the word of God. They're led by the Holy Spirit and not to depend on their mentor. We're to love each other, but we're to depend on Christ. That's where the transformation happens. The image of the disciple becoming the image of God. I don't know if the image of a disciple is any clearer to you today. This will be a start. I'm hoping a picture of a disciple Maybe it's got a few more pixels in there for you because I don't think it's the picture of Christianity that we have in the world today. I really don't. Being a disciple or discipling someone is much more than a sinner's prayer. It's much more than that. We're going to continue this next week. We're going to look at barriers to discipleship. We're going to look at barriers to being a disciple. It's interesting, these two words, they interchange so much, but they're so important. We're going to continue in that. But we need to get it right, being a disciple. We need to get this right, or everything else that comes from this pulpit will never, ever be profitable to any one of us if we do not understand what a disciple is like it was when Jesus called his disciples. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this day, Lord. Lord, I just so hope that we understand what a disciple really is. It's so important. It's so important, Lord. None of us want to be one of those many's that Jesus didn't know because they weren't followers. Please help us to change our lives so that we look like you, Lord, that we'll be your disciples and we'll do what you'll have us to do. We'll follow you because we know that we're with you because you've touched us. But thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. That little interim period right after the message, huh? I hate this awkward time. Can we do one of these or something? You know, you guys got to chill out. Being a disciple is important, folks. We're going to talk about it again next week. I want us to understand discipleship. I want us to all be, be being discipled or discipling someone, everyone here. I think that's what we need to be. You know, if that's really where we need to be. So important. But I'd like to see, uh, could I have you two gentlemen take up an offering again today, please? Would you, would you be so kind? I'm, I'm putting these guys to work. <coughs> Just this time, uh, David, don't take any money out, okay? Just put it in. They're right over there, if you would, please. 
if, 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 if grab those trays and, and I'll pray and you'll be off the, and, and we'll be off. I'll just pray for a moment, okay? Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you that we can give back to you because you've given us everything, Lord. Father, please help us to be the followers of you that we need to be. Help us to praise you in all that we do and let our hearts be worshipful as we go through this week. We thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, you know, we actually have quite a few things going on. You know, it's really quiet in here, but, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening that you're not aware of, you know. Uh, we've got a new leather couch in the back office. 